A couple days ago, we asked the question as to whether or not Jeff Brom was going to take multiple tight ends in the portal this offseason, and it seems like we've gotten our answer. On today's episode of the Locked On Global Podcast, we're talking about the Cardinals getting a commitment from Ball State tight end Tanner Koziel and more. So with that being said, let's get right on into the show. You are Locked On Louisville, your daily podcast on the Louisville Cardinals. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome into another episode of the Locked On Global Podcast. I'm your host, Dalton Pence. Today's episode brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. As always, I want to take this time to personally thank you all for making us your first listen of the day. Just a reminder that the Locked On Global Podcast is free on all streaming services, five days a week, your team, every day. When San Diego State tight end Mark Redman committed to the Louisville program on Tuesday, we asked whether or not Jeff Brom was going to add multiple tight ends in the portal this offseason. And, well, that question was quickly answered on Wednesday when Ball State tight end Tanner Koziel uh, announced his pledge to Jeff Brom's squad. We'll talk about um, what he brings to this team for 2024 and beyond. We'll also talk about uh, Cardinal star running back Jawar Jordan heading to the NFL and what this means for the running backs room next season. And then to conclude the show, we'll talk about the state of the men's basketball program after the two losses to DePaul and Arkansas State. So um, – a lot of good stuff to talk about on today's episode of the show. We begin with another portal commitment. This is the Cardinals' fifth commitment via the transfer portal in eight days. It started out with Tyler Shuck, the Texas Tech quarterback. They got some help in the trenches when Harvard defensive lineman Thor Griffith and Yale offensive lineman Jonathan Mendoza committed over the weekend. Um, Mark Redman, tight end from San Diego State, committed on Tuesday bringing the total up to four. And we asked the question as to whether or not the Cardinals were going to go back to the portal for another tight end. I had heard rumblings that Jeff Brom was looking to add multiple players at the position. And well, that question was answered very quickly after when the Cardinals added Tanner Koziel. Tanner, um, the transfer from Ball State, was on campus recently before his commitment. And that just goes to show you that to really – Focus in on who Louisville is prioritizing. You see the visits. You see who is visiting the program, and that will tell you. It told you the story last year, and it's starting to have a good track record in terms of forecasting this year as well. All five players uh, were on campus for Louisville at some point before their commitments. But I like this move for both parties. Um, for Koziel, Transferring from a non-Power 5 to a Power 5, obviously, that means more exposure. I think that that um, is obviously a key uh, priority. And then not to mention, the Ball State offense is pretty run dominant. So for him to be able to put up the statistics that he put up in the two seasons with the Cardinals, I think it's pretty solid. He had 35 receptions for 373 yards and seven touchdowns as a freshman. And then this past year, 34 for 295 and three touchdowns. I wouldn't really look too much into the statistical drop-off um, considering the nature of what scheme Ball State runs. But I think that this means that there definitely is some potential there for him to be able to translate that game from where he was to now being at a Power 5 school. What that means for 2024, we'll talk about here in a second, but Koziel, th this makes a ton of sense for him because you're going to obviously a better program. You are going to get some playing time this upcoming year, and you're going to an offense that prioritizes the tight end position versus being a part of a run heavy offense. So this makes sense for him. On the other side of things, for Louisville's sake, it makes sense as well. I was always under the assumption that the Cardinals were going to take multiple players at the position. It made sense. You lost Joey Gatewood. You lost uh, Josh Livson. And, yeah, you're bringing in Dylan Mesman. You're obviously now bringing in uh, Mark Redman as well. But you look at that position, and Nate Kariski 
had some big time plays this year. But outside of that, you're not really returning a ton of production. The position really wasn't all that productive anyway this year. So you look at guys like Dwayne Martin, Jamar Johnson, Nate Kariski, three players that um, you would have to be relying upon to take the step forward. And that's not to say that they cannot, but with the scholarships at your disposal, it makes sense as to why Louisville went out and got multiple players at the tight end position. But a lot of different um, you know, schemes, playing styles that Louisville has, sets, they go with a multiple tight end base package. So I think that um, – Kozio's ability not only to block, he obviously was a part of a run-heavy offense in which it was imperative that he was able to block, but he's also able to catch the ball as well. Six foot seven, 230-pound native of Bloomingdale, Illinois, um, has a sort of deceptive speed for his size. I think that that's sort of a, a key trait for a good tight end, especially in college, is a larger tight end that can block but also has that deceptive speed that's able to uh, really, really help out in the receiving aspect. So it looks to me, you know, Redmond and Koziel both are pretty solid blocking, but they're also very, very good in the passing game. And I think that that is an extreme key because it's an aspect of the offense that you truly didn't have for the majority of the season that I felt like could have unlocked a ton of potential. What these moves do for the Cardinals, I think that it helps you get closer to being able to unlock your ceiling. Now, granted, you have to address the running back position. You have to keep adding on to the offensive line, to the wide receiver position, et cetera. But I like that Brom went out and got two very respectable tight end options out of the portal, uh, players that succeeded with a, a good amount of targets in their respective stops. And for Koziel, one thing that you have to look at here is I know I'm not – so sure that he's going to start over Mark Redman. I think Redman is going to be your number one tight end option, could end up being one of the best tight ends in the ACC this upcoming season, and um, has only one year remaining. For Koziel, I think that you have the opportunity to play a decent amount this year. You might not necessarily be the top option at tight end, but you're going to play a decent amount. But next year, when you're a senior, because he has two years remaining, you could definitely be the go-to guy in the room and you have some continuity at the position. So I think it might get a little bit overlooked when you look at this acquisition uh, or this addition because of, yes, you're getting a very solid player. But don't overlook the continuity aspect either, assuming that he stays for the remaining of his uh, collegiate career. Two seasons with the Cardinals gives you a little bit of uh, comfort with this scheme, with this coaching staff, and um, just some continuity in the offense to where you don't have to go every single year and have to address every single position via the portal, although that's sort of how things have become. But I like this move for Louisville. I like this move for Koziel. Um For me, the tight end position wasn't the highest priority on the list. But it was a priority. I felt like Louisville needed to get better at the position. And they have some players in the or on the roster right now, like Jamar Johnson, like Nate Kariski, like Dwayne Martin, now Dylan Mesman, the high three-star, low four-star tight end from Michigan. I think all four of those guys have potential and can all four play for the Cardinals. But it does make you wonder now, with theoretically six tight ends on the roster, do they have a feeling that one of the tight ends ends up transferring out? That is definitely a fair question to ask. I haven't heard any rumblings in terms of players transferring from that room, but I guess it wouldn't necessarily surprise me, especially if one of those players is buried down the depth chart. But at the end of the day, you have to do what you have to do to put your team in the best position to win games. So, I'm just fine with the Cardinals going with two tight ends, especially uh, two tight ends with extremely solid size, very good blockers, and uh, veteran guys that have shown that they're reliable in the passing game as well, being able to open up that opportunity and that ceiling. So it's A-OK -okay with me. I actually was probably um, you know, wanting to go after – two players at the position because of some potential depth issues. But here we are. 
within the first five commitments, two of them being tight ends, I like the addition of Tanner Koziel to the Cardinals program, especially with being that second tight end option. So um, very good start to the portal for the Cardinals. Unfortunately, one of the decisions from a current star didn't necessarily go the way we might have wanted it to as Louisville fans, as running back Jawar Jordan announced on Wednesday that he is headed to the NFL. This move doesn't surprise me. And it sucks. I wish him the best of luck. Question now, what does Louisville do for the running back position moving forward? Well, we're going to talk about that here momentarily after we talk about our friends over at Prize Picks. If you didn't know, Already, well, now you do. Prize Picks is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. It's the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS. It's just you against the numbers. You pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. With basketball season in full swing of things, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the Specials League, a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. For example, you can go with LeBron James plus Travis Kelsey at a 10.5 combo of three-pointers made plus receptions. Another reason why I think Price Picks is unique is they even offer a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. Uh, what that means, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second half, that player is rebooted so it does not affect your current winnings that essentially gets voided out. So prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. Do yourself a favor, go check out all the great advantages at prizepicks.com slash locked on college and use the code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. Once again, prizepicks.com slash locked on college using the code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. Hey, what's going on, Louisville fans? Thanks again for making the show your first listen of the day. If you don't know, well, you need to tune in. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. You know, it's been a very, very interesting past couple weeks with uh, the Louisville football program in terms of recruiting. There's been a lot of names that uh, have been tossed out there that the Cardinals have offered. Some players have visited the program. We're still waiting on some key decisions from current stars, and I think that those decisions really can lead you to see what exactly are the top needs. Well, the running back position was up in the air because of the pending decisions from Jawar Jordan and Isaac Garendo. We got the first of those decisions on Wednesday. Jawar Jordan has announced that he is going to the NFL. Makes sense to me. Um, an older running back, you know, running back doesn't have that at the position doesn't have a ton of shelf life in terms of the NFL. So you really have to capitalize. So I don't, um, I don't hate this move for Jawar. Obviously, it sucks as a Louisville fan, but I, I think that this is probably the right move for him. I'm not sure how much more he could have raised his stock. He had a career year, uh, 181 carries, 1,128 yards to go along with 13 touchdowns, 6.2 yards per carry, had great games all season long against Duke, against um, North, or North Carolina, Notre Dame. I said it before the season a million times that I believe that he was going to be the next 1,000-yard rusher for the Cardinals program, and he ended up being just that. I hated to see him battle injury all season after or halfway through the season up until the end. It sucks to see that because he was on pace for a historical season, but um, you knew that he was the star that Louisville was needing in the running backs room, a key part or a key reason as to why this team went 10-2 and in the regular season. So... Truthfully, I wish him the best. I, I think that uh, we need to call a spade a spade and realize that he it had one of the best running back seasons in program history for the Cardinals, and he was fantastic. Um, I am extremely grateful that he decided to just continually fight his way up the depth chart to where he was the feature back and absolutely balled out. So shout out to Jaws, man. 
Um, I really, truly am going to miss him, as are a lot of Louisville fans. And he leaves a large hole in, in the running backs room. So what does this mean? for the running backs room. Well, you have to look at what the pieces are at now. Now we're still waiting for Isaac Garendo's decision. If he comes back, well, you have a potential RB1 for next year because there were times down the stretch where Garendo had some flat-out huge performances for this team, and he could definitely be an RB1 option. You have Maurice Turner, um, who has shown his ability to be a solid change of pace back. When his number is called, he can make some things happen on the ground. Kiwan Brown, the redshirt or soon to be redshirt freshman from Atlanta, had a very good game against Murray State. Granted, it was Murray State, but he could be an option in the backfield. And then you have two uh, very solid running backs in the 2024 class Isaac Brown, who has gotten a ton of great reviews mm -hmm. over the past couple months during his senior season and the state championship, to where he could have a phenomenal freshman year. You have uh, Duke Watson as well, high three-star, low four-star running back from Georgia, who also is a quality option. So if you let's say you bring back Turner Brown, um, Isaac Brown, and Duke Watson, you have four players there. Um, even if Grindo comes back, I look for Braum to add another running back. If he doesn't, maybe they add two. It could be Jalen Lucas. There's Don Chaney from um, Miami, another player who's been mentioned in the mix. Chaney had almost 500 yards in a very balanced back, very balanced backfield this year. He would essentially, I believe, have two years of eligibility remaining. So who knows where that goes. But, um, yeah, I think that you're still going to be looking for that RB1 in the portal because it's still up in the air as to whether or not Isaac Garendo is going to come back. If he does, I think you look to add another rotational guy that you can plug in sort of like how you did with Jordan and Garendo and be able to run the running backs in that regard. But let's say that Garendo doesn't come back. I think you look to add a legitimate starting level player and another rotational piece. What does this mean? Well, unfortunately, if you add two running backs or if Grindo comes back and you add another running back, well, you're going to have to make sure that you um, do whatever you can to persuade Maurice Turner and Kiwan Brown to stick around because that is sort of the other side of the portal that you have to always consider is that, hey, look, adding players in is great, but roster retention is gets tougher with the more players that you bring in. So I could definitely see that being a spot to where maybe things change. I imagine both Isaac Brown and Duke Watson hold true to their commitments and sign on that dotted line here uh, fairly shortly. Uh, next week, I believe, is nat early National Signing Day. Um, but I, I think you the two players you would then look for will be Maurice Turner and Kiwan Brown, obviously the former would hurt more than the latter because of what Turner's been able to do when his number is called. And I think that he has his best days of football ahead of him. Truthfully, it's kind of like Jawar Jordan early on in his Louisville career. It's all he needs is the opportunity. So, you know, I trust Jeff Brom, Chris Barclay, Brian Brom to make the right decisions when it comes to adding those players in the portal because they see these guys on a daily basis in practice. Um, but things are wide open now. Obviously, if George Jordan would have returned, that meant that you have your starter. Now it's just a matter of filling out depth, and I didn't really have an issue with the guys that were currently on the roster. But Jordan is now gone. There is a very real possibility that Garendo could be gone as well. We will see. He has another year of eligibility remaining should he so choose to use it. Obviously, he can go to the portal, he can go to the NFL, or he can return. So we will see what his decision is going to be. I do hope that whatever decision it is, I want to get that decision somewhat soon along with the decision of Jamari Thrash. And that's just me being selfish, hoping to, you know, see what it is we need because that can really affect um, how you go about the transfer portal. But regardless, I trust the Brahms to field the team in 2024 that's going to be extremely competitive and could rival the 2023 team, <clears throat> excuse me, for the amount of talent that they have on offense. So they've done a good job already. They've got the quarterback. They've got an offensive lineman. They've got two tight ends. Now it's a matter of continually adding in the trenches. 
there's going to be multiple wide receivers and running backs on campus this week. And we're going to talk about that in the upcoming episodes. Um, but truthfully speaking, all eyes are on the skill positions at this point on the offensive side of the ball and offensive line as well. So let's put football to the side for a moment. Um, let's go to men's basketball. Uh, the Cardinals have now lost three straight games. Um, they lost to Virginia Tech uh, a couple weekends ago, and then they lost to DePaul and had a really tough loss to Arkansas State. And it has a lot of people wondering, okay, when is a change coming? We'll talk about the state of men's basketball here momentarily after we talk about our friends and the title sponsor of the show, FanDuel. The weather gets colder, but make no mistake about it, the NFL offers stay hot on FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and my favorite, single-game parlays. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to kick off the NFL season. Once again, FanDuel is the official partner of the NFL. Men's basketball. Okay, let's have a conversation. I've had a couple of people uh, reach out in the YouTube comments and have asked where the men's basketball content has been. And it, it's a fair question to ask. And I'm not, you know, getting on any of the comments or anything like that or scalding or criticizing. Here's my take on it. For me, the football program has been doing a lot of great things in recruiting. You've had the Kentucky matchup. You've had it, the first ever ACC championship game that this program has played in. So talking about men's basketball – for a team that really hasn't shown much improvement from last year to this year, I mean, truthfully, it, it seemed like it, it was repeating the same stuff as that we were questioning effort, questioning rebounding, questioning three point shooting, what the offensive and I, what the offensive and defensive identities were, and it felt like almost like a broken record. And I understand that you want to hear more about um, football recruiting than you do hearing about Louisville losing a game, losing another game, or winning a game very closely against a team that they theoretically should blow out. So that that's really just a matter of that is just how the content has come about. But it, it's not a matter of me, you know, just not caring or, you know, hiding from the truth or anything like that, or you understand what I'm saying. It was more so – really because of football, the men's basketball. But right now, I think that, put it this way, you can say what it is you want about the program, the state of the program in which Kenny Payne inherited back in 2022. You can say what you want about the four-win season. Now, there is a lot of people that say no excuses. You had opportunities. The coaching wasn't there. Four wins wasn't good enough. This team had talent. There's also the the notion of the other side of the fan base that believe that, hey, look, still we're under the black cloud in recruiting. That finally got lifted. Um, this wasn't his team. And it's going to take some patience. He had to clean up more than you see on the surface. Personally, for me, let's stop talking about 2022. For the record, I wanted to see what he could do with a second season with an open, non-clouded offseason to where he has the scholarships, the playing time available to go into the portal, to go get his guys that he felt could best give him the opportunity to win. And I wanted to see how that translated over into 2023 in terms of wins. Now, granted, they have tied their number of wins. They are, at the moment, 4-6 and six on the season. They've tied their number of wins from last year. But truthfully, I haven't seen anything this season that gives me confidence heading into a potential year three that I was hoping to see. I stayed out of the 
reality of having a take and put myself into a wait and see approach. You know, I didn't have, um, you know, a belief in one or the other, but I wanted to see what happened. And at the moment, 10 games into the season, it looks a lot like last year. The issues of last year are the issues of this year. The offensive and defensive identities, I still couldn't tell you what they are 40 games into the tenure. The issue with guard play is another thing that carried over between 2022-23-223-24. Defensive rebounding, defending, three-point shooting, all issues again. The portal... I felt like um, you look at the class that they brought in, they opted to go with more youth than experience, and it really hasn't done anything for them. Karan Davis is apparently no longer with the program, and truthfully, I don't understand what exactly happened there, going from he's not in trouble to now he's no longer with the program. I don't know, personally. Um, Danilo Jovanovic hasn't played a huge role. Um, Tyler Johnson has been very, very solid. Caleb Glenn, Curtis Williams haven't played as much as I thought that they might. And when they do play, I feel like they give good minutes. Um, Dennis Evans, uh, I believe, is dealing with an injury. You've had some injury issues. Uh, JJ Trainer has dealt with injury. Trenton Flowers left before the season to go play in Australia. And to make a long story short, the class that you brought in, the team that you have, was supposed to be more talented on paper, but yet we're not seeing the improvements that we were hoping to see. And I I was hoping that, you know, with the losses to Texas and Indiana, it looked like, hey, maybe a light turned on. But in the games against New Mexico State and Bellarmine and Virginia Tech, it looks like the team regressed to what we had been used to. They lost to a DePaul team that you couldn't lose to. And now you lost to Arkansas State. I was at the game. Truthfully, I, I think it might be the worst game of the Kenny Payne tenure. Uh, the crowd almost seemed apathetic. And for me, the main alarming thing was the effort. Once again, the effort just was not there for a full 40 minutes, probably for the majority of the game. And it, it sucks for me because obviously you want – Kenny Payne to work out in Louisville. I would want nothing more to him to be the next coach to give us a national championship. That's the goal. But at this point, this was going to be a telltale year. You had to win games this year. For me, the expectation was getting to the NCAA tournament. And looking at this team right now, looking down to when the schedule gets tougher, because here in two games you play Kentucky and then go into conference play, nothing is changing. And it seems like at this point in time that it seems like we're all but heading towards a personnel change at Louisville. And whether or not that is in the near future or at the end of the season, truthfully, I don't know. There are people out there that are led to believe that it could happen very soon. There's also those that believe, "Mm, no, it's not going to happen until the end of the year. Personally, I don't know. But one thing that it feels like, I I just don't necessarily understand how there could be a year three at the moment, barring an absolutely unexpected change to where they go on a winning streak and turn things around, um, a switch flips, and they're in a spot to where, you know, they're completely changing the way they play. But at this point in time, um, it, it just doesn't seem like things are getting better from they're from a recruiting standpoint, from a PR standpoint, obviously the national perception and national image of this program in the national media is truthfully embarrassing. And, um, yo, I, I believe Kenny Payne is a great guy and I truly wish it would work out for him in his tenure here, but for whatever reason, it just feels like we're now on a collision course with some type of a change. And I think the only variable now is time. So we'll see what that means. We'll see if there's a change coming shortly. If it's in a couple months, I don't know. I mean, I'm going to cheer this team on regardless. And, um, you know, 
hope that this program can get back to a spot to where it once was. So for those that think I'm scared to talk about men's basketball or, you know, completely just neglecting the topic, it's truthfully because there's been a lot of football news and really not a lot of positive basketball news. And let's be honest, you're not going to click on a title that has Louisville loses to blank versus Louisville offers or Louisville gets a commitment from insert transfer portal star here. So um, we'll talk about whatever we need to talk about. We'll get as honest as we need to be. But that's going to wrap up today's episode of the show. Coming up here over the next couple of days as we head into the weekend, we're going to talk about some of the transfer portal players that will be on campus this weekend um, for Louisville and much more. So with that being said, be sure to stay tuned, keep your eyes peeled, and we'll see you right back here.